Here we go, diving further down into the Cthulhu Mythos rabbit hole. We've recently looked at other Lovecraftian horror titles such as The Baby in Yellow and the more recently released Dredge. Today though we'll be looking at a game from 2005. Welcome to a video explaining the story behind Headfirst Studios' Call of Cthulhu Dark Corners of the Earth. Based on the fiction of writer Howard Philip Lovecraft, this game was itself a reimagining of the story of Lovecraft's novella The Shadow Over Innsmouth, which itself made up part of the Cthulhu mythos. The game itself features certain key parts of the novella in its level design and certain characters. However, this game was in reality actually based upon a campaign from the Call of Cthulhu tabletop game called Escape from Innsmouth. Anyway, I played this game years ago on the original Xbox and I actually never played beyond the first three hours or so. The initial part of the game was exceptional and so, so, so creepy. The gameplay has aged, especially the shooting mechanics, but the game was still an enjoyable experience from start to finish. It did have a certain charm, as most games from this era did. Now, here is the inevitable spoiler warning that I put in all my videos, but with all that out the way, let's begin. The game starts in 1915. Boston police detective Jack Walters is called to an old manor house after reports of shooting. He isn't there for that reason though. It turns out the manor, actually named the Harmonic House, is the headquarters of a strange cult. The cult's leader, a man named Victor Holt, requested that Jack enter the house and that in exchange they would cooperate with the police. However, itchy trigger fingers prevailed and a violent and bloody shootout took place between the cultists and the police. Jack did manage to enter the property. He discovers that this cult called themselves the Cult of Yith. They worshipped a race of otherworldly mythical beings called Yithians. Not only that, but the cult had been spying on Jack for a while, prior to him arriving at the Harmonic House. Diaries from the cultists reveal that after a surveillance period of two months, they were all eagerly waiting for the Day of Contact. They refer to the Yithians as their masters, speaking of them stepping through the gate. The cultist speaks of them losing members of their order due to experiments, and the note speaks of Jack's gifts. You see, Jack was a detective who managed to be able to solve and close cases with minimal or no evidence. He was regarded by his colleagues as very gifted. Jack would be able to see through other people's eyes, but for obvious reasons, he kept that to himself. There's a specific reason for Jack's gifting, but we will get to that. Anyway, Jack finds an ancient Greek manuscript called the Narcotica, which again mentions a distant but otherworldly antiquity or an ancient period in time. It also speaks of races so strange that they are beyond the scope of human comprehension. Time travel, flying polyps and mental projection. Jack then manages to discover a secret passageway that leads to an underground area. He finds the bodies of the deceased cult members lost to the aforementioned experiments. Later on, down the line, Jack finds a man strapped to some sort of contraption. And then Jack finds an odd looking portal type structure and he presses the button. The police searched for Jack and found him, but they had to send him to Arkham Asylum due to the fact that they considered him clinically insane. But six years later, Jack regained his sanity and started working as a private detective. Jack, in regard to his experience in the Harmonic House, says that it only seems like yesterday that he was there and he can't recall anything from in between. Jack, from what he remembers, obtained a fanatical obsession with the occult. Then Jack receives a phone call from a man named Arthur Anderson. Anderson is the regional manager of the first national chain of grocery stores. He manages a store in a small secluded fishing town called Innsmouth. However, the store was recently robbed and the store's manager, Brian Burnham, has gone missing too, with Burnham, who is apparently on the run, being the main suspect. Anderson, however, didn't believe that Burnham could have done it, so he hires Jack to go and investigate. Reluctant to help at first, Jack eventually comes around and arrives via bus to Innsmouth on the 7th of February 1922. Jack notices that the gates of the town were locked, and the driver says it's to keep people out who are looking for work, and who seek to meddle in the town's affairs. Arriving and questioning the driver about Brian Burnham, the driver claims to know absolutely nothing. 
Jack speaks to the owner of the Gilman Hotel, Charlie Gilman, who tells him that the rooms at the hotel aren't ready at the moment due to them being clean because, as Gilman puts it, outsiders leave a terrible mess. Asking a police constable who appears to be guarding something for directions, he too is not helpful. Jack also finds a grand locked building called the Esoteric Order of Dagon. After dodging another policeman, Jack then finds an entrance via an alleyway to the First National Grocery Store. Jack discovers that the First National and Burnham were performing exceptionally well. So why would Burnham rob the store and take off? Jack hears someone breaking down the door, so he has to escape via a floor hatch but falls down and is locked inside an underground storeroom. Jack finds a newspaper which talks about a man named Captain Obed Marsh, who in 1846 was arrested on suspicion of devil worship. It also states that Marsh was responsible for founding the esoteric order of Dagon after he discovered an ancient religion in the Pacific Islands. Escaping the building, Jack runs into a man named Lucas Mackey. He seems to know Jack, and why he is there, to look for Burnham. Mackey then states that he's not from Innsmouth himself, but he is there to investigate the Marsh refinery and has been sent by the US government. He says that he has an appointment with Jacob Marsh, and then he leaves. Shortly afterwards, Jack sees a vision through the eyes of someone else, someone stalking from the roofs of Innsmouth. Another conversation with the constable reveals that the disappearance of Burnham is a matter for the Order of Dagon. Jack is surprised that it's not a matter for the police, but nonetheless he learns of another robbery at another store in Innsmouth belonging to a man named Thomas Waite. Conversations with locals don't yield much fruit either, they claim to know nothing about, well, anything at all. Jack confirms that creepy things are happening in Innsmouth as he sees someone being dragged through a door in a cellar. He comes across a woman who refuses to give Jack her name, she welcomes into Innsmouth but she warns him that he needs to do what he needs to do and then leave straight away. She warns him that she can't be seen talking with him due to the danger that the Order pose. Jack also meets a local drunk by the name of Zadok Allen. Zadok is a very chatty man, but after Jack gives Zadok a bottle of bootleg rum that he found in the First National, old Zadok sings like a canary. Despite speaking in strange riddles, Zadok does offer up some useful information. He mentions the history of Innsmouth and Obed Marsh's involvement in that history. He talks of Obed Marsh being jailed and of a massacre in Innsmouth. He speaks of creatures and something called the Oaths of Dagon. A religion was formed and eventually the Marsh family took over Innsmouth completely. Zadok himself seems to harbour a major dislike towards the esoteric order of Dagon and towards the Marsh family in general. And then Zadok also speaks about the aforementioned Thomas Waite. It looks like Jack has his next lead. Jack is approached by the strange woman who seems to have had a change of heart. She introduces herself as Rebecca Lawrence. She mentions that Brian Burnham was dating a young woman in the town called Ruth Billingham, a woman whose family has influence within the Order. Rebecca tells Jack that Innsmouth is a strange place, with things that have no business being there. She reveals a strange sign that her father discovered through an old manuscript, which seems to ward off the more unusual elements in Innsmouth. What's more, a further conversation with Rebecca reveals more about the history of Innsmouth and the arrest of Obed Marsh. It was actually her grandfather, John Lawrence, that led the arrest party out to a reef known as Devil's Reef to capture Obed Marsh for suspected devil worship. After throwing Marsh and his order into the jail, John was killed during the Innsmouth Massacre of 1846, the massacre that Zadok mentioned earlier on. Anyway, she also mentioned something very crucial to Jack's investigation. The Waits Variety Store robbery was actually due to something very valuable to the order being held inside the safe. Rebecca points Jack towards the location of Thomas Waite's home. Travelling through the Innsmouth poorhouse, Jack arrives at Thomas Waite's house and meets Waite's young daughter Ramona. Ramona says that her mother is in the attic, as she's been bad. Asking to speak to her mother, Ramona says no because her mother bites and growls. Thomas isn't there so Jack has a look around whilst Ramona draws pictures. Jack finds a family photo which has the mother removed from it, but he suffers another vision, this time from the house's attic. He approaches the attic door.
Going downstairs, Thomas Waits has now arrived home and is holding his deceased daughter in his arms. Thomas explains that they don't have much time, but he mentions that Brian Burnham never left Innsmouth, that he was caught by the Order of Dagon. He also mentions that his safe in the store hasn't been touched, but he pleads with Jack to take the valuable item that is there and get it out of Innsmouth. Waite gives Jack the key to the store. The Innsmouth police then burst into the house and arrest Thomas Waite for the murder of his daughter. Jack picks up Ramona's colouring book and the images in there reveal that the girl's mind was very disturbed. Jack goes to Waits' store and there he finds Ruth Billingham trying to access the safe. She threatens Jack with the family's connections to the Order of Dagon. The moment Jack mentions that he's from out of town, she changes her tune. Ruth reveals that she wanted to get out of Innsmouth and she saw Brian as a chance to do so. She gives Jack a photo to give to Brian Burnham and she tells Jack she'll be waiting at an old cannery for the next couple of days. Jack gains access to the safe and finds an ancient book. No wonder the Order wanted it so badly, because it's the Book of Dagon. A translated book which mentions incredibly old individuals known as Father Dagon and Mother Hydra. It also talks of the Dark God, the Great Cthulhu, who lies entombed in slumber, dreaming in the great underwater city of Relia. The book has not yet been fully translated, but now Jack has the book, it's time to leave Innsmouth. Speaking to the bus driver, it turns out that the bus has broken down, meaning that Jack has to stay in Innsmouth for the night. Rebecca doesn't offer Jack a place to stay, much to his dismay. It looks like he's gonna have to spend the night in Charlie Gilman's Hotel of Horrors. I say Hotel of Horrors for good reason, as Jack is about to discover. He overhears the bus driver Joe telling Charlie Gilman that he's been given specific instructions by the order that the outsider, Jack, is not to leave tonight. Jack speaks with Gilman and suffers another vision of Gilman in his office, chopping something up. Despite this creepy vision, Jack takes board at the hotel as he has no other option. Gilman leaves to speak with the police constable and Jack eavesdrops. What's it you want to make them? Where about to lodge the outsider? Top of the house. Plenty of rooms up there. <laughs> Probably 401. Instructions under the order are to make certain he don't leave the hotel. That's the direct command of Robert Marsh himself. They reckon the outsiders seen too much of Innsmouth's ways. You can tell Robert he can always rely on Charlie to see things done properly. Yeah, you better be certain of that. What you done with old weeds? That's a matter for the order to settle. He's in jail for the present. They're out looking for it now. Something was always wrong with that Tom Waits. Not right betwixt the ears, if you get my meaning. Well, if you don't think for it, they'll probably take him out to the reef. Make proper use of him there. If you ain't needing anything more, I'll be getting back to my work. I think we're done for now, Charlie. Jack then checks out Gilman's office. Gilman has been murdering and poorly disposing of his hotel guests likely the outsiders who had wandered into the town looking for work. Not only that, but Gilman's diary reveals him as a cannibal too. If Jack isn't careful, he too suffered the same fate. After being shown to his room, Jack gets to work securing the room and the room next to him, just in case. Jack then sleeps and he has a dream. The great city of Narcotis. Rest now, Jack, you are safe. What was in the light, Jack? Where do you want to go? We are your history, Jack, and your future. I don't understand. You will, in time. Gilman, where have you put the outsider? Top of the house, room 401. Come on, let's have it. Jack then has visions of people coming for him and he awakens to the sound of men coming to his door. He's in danger and needs to get out, fast. The men chase him and try to break his door down and try and kill him. After a perilous chase through the hotel rooms and across some rooftops, Jack makes it into a warehouse, but he's still being hunted by the Innsmouth townsfolk who claim to hunt him in the name of the Order of Dagon. Sneaking through the warehouses and the streets, 
Jack comes across a man who tells him that the only way he'll avoid the Order's mob is to go through the Innsmouth sewers. But the man warns Jack that the sewers aren't much safer than the streets. Rumours are that darkness lives in the sewers. The man speaks of something called a Shoggoth. Jack heads for the sewers and uses a rather creative method of entry, sitting in the back of a truck and sending it down into a reservoir. He is now in the sewers. But Jack starts to see visions and hallucinations. He hears and sees Ramona wait, which wreaks havoc on his sanity. The sewers are also covered in a corrosive slimy substance too, which appears to have melted some poor sucker. Jack spots the lifeless body of old Zadok Allen, who appears to have been disposed of by the Order of Dagon. His fate is mirrored in line with the book The Shadow River Innsmouth, where just as in game, he was killed for sharing too much information with outsiders. Zadok's body is taken by what is only assumed to be the aforementioned Shoggoth. Eventually though, Jack leaves the sewers and is back onto street level. Still being hunted, Jack makes his way through the buildings until he enters into a house. He finds a minister's journal on a bed, and inside it, Jack reads about the evil that began in 1846. The minister speaks about his congregation diminishing, and the Innsmouth townsfolk developing certain characteristics. Gurgling voices, bulging eyes, thickened skin, shriveled necks, and a loss of hair was quickly coined as the Innsmouth look by outsiders. This was thought to be some sort of plague. The minister writes that it all started from the Marsh family, although he doesn't know where exactly this came from, but that the Order see the look as a blessing, and the Order called themselves purebloods. This church minister was Rebecca Lawrence's father, and this is Rebecca's house. He speaks with her. She reveals that Brian Burnham is being held in the town's jailhouse until he's needed for sacrifice to their god, Dagon, that the Order will take him out to Devil's Reef, and that he will never be seen again. Jack agrees that he needs to save Brian Burnham, not because he believes in all this Order of Dagon nonsense, but because he doesn't want a death on his conscience. Jack needs to travel past an old water tower in order to reach the jail. Rebecca speaks of a secret crypt underneath her father's church. Her father was killed by the Order for refusing to bow to their weird religion. And just like that, the Order fire upon the house and Rebecca and Jack have to escape, but Rebecca is shot and killed as they arrive at the church. Jack pushes on and finds and enters the crypt. He enters into some more sewers and hears Ramona again. But back on street level, Jack makes his way through a burning bank and after a long and stressful experience, he finally makes it to the water tower and gains entry to another building where he meets Lucas Mackey again. Mackey essentially warns Jack. The government, who Mackey is working for, have poured a lot of time and money into their investigations into what's going on in Innsmouth, and they don't want Jack to ruin their investigations. Jack mentions that he's just interested in rescuing Brian Burnham, and then Mackey points him towards the jailhouse, which is just outside of a window. Outside, he hears the police officers talking about the sacrifices being locked up in the jail. Jack manages to speak to Brian Burnham through the bars of his cell. Burnham says that the police haven't charged him with anything at all. But Burnham tells Jack to leave him be, otherwise the madman in the neighbouring cell will scream. Jack uses the madman as a distraction to get inside the jailhouse and head upstairs to try and find a key for the cells. He does so, but Burnham tells Jack they doesn't trust him, so Jack hands Burnham the photo Ruth Billingham gave him, earning his trust. The two then escape through more sewers and come to a deserted warehouse where they meet Mackey. Quizzed on his real reason for being there, Mackey says that he's an undercover agent working for the United States Treasury Department, which has been working closely with the FBI. Mackey says everything starts with the Innsmouth look, and that half the town's population must be infected by now. Mackey mentions that further on down the road there will be some FBI agents there, and they will be safely picked up. That's if they can make it there. Whilst Burnham is fixing up the truck that they need in order to make their escape, Jack is sent on an errand to get a brooch belonging to Ruth. Jack sees a vision of a creature placing something inside the safe. Inside the safe, Jack finds the brooch. In one of the cells, Jack also finds Obed Marsh's shipping logs. It reads that in March of 1823, whilst sailing the seas of Polynesia, Obed Marsh and his crew came across an island which wasn't on their charts. The inhabitants of the island, a tribe known as the Kanaki, weren't interested in trading for gold, as they already had lots of it. Marsh then asked for the source of the gold, as he wished to set up his own gold mining operation back on shore. As well as worshipping the Great Old Ones, such as the Great Cthulhu himself, the Kanaki tribe also worshipped a race known as the Deep Ones. Marsh was then taken to another island by the tribe, who showed him some strange ancient ruins. They revealed the ruins of a great city as the source of the gold Marsh seeks. The tribe then told Marsh about certain legends. Marsh then aimed to secure the gold from the ruins. After they'd traded food and water for gold, the crew left the island, 
and Marsh told his crew not to mention the island to anyone because others would surely go there if they found out about it. The tribe's chief, Wallachia, had made Marsh several small metal discs and taught him some chants that could apparently summon the sea gods. The following year, Marsh returned to the island to find no sign of the tribe and that their villages had been burned to the ground. Marsh assumed that another tribe attacked the island. Naturally, with the ability to obtain the gold now gone, they tried to search for it but to no avail. The crew then returned to Innsmouth, that Marsh feared would now struggle for trade. Then, months later, Marsh remembered the metal discs given to him by Wallachia and the mention of gold-bearing sea gods. Desperate, Marsh sailed out to Devil's Reef and tried the chants the tribe taught him along with using the metal discs. He discovered that the sea gods are indeed very real. They gave him gold, but despite the town enjoying the gold he bought to Innsmouth, this led to Marsh being arrested for devil worship. But anyway, after that enthralling read, Jack finds the body of Thomas Waite. He's retired himself. Jack also finds the Oaths of Dagon, which the followers of the Order must adhere to. It speaks of the Deep Ones and also speaks of taking children of Dagon as husbands and wives and for them to raise children to continue some sort of race and so that their faith can prosper. As a side note, Obed Marsh partook in this himself, married a Deep One and had children. But with the brooch in hand and the truck fixed, Jack and Brian hop in and drive towards the cannery all whilst being shot at by the Innsmouth townsfolk but they do eventually make it to the cannery. Once inside the cannery, Jack encounters strange fishmen. Are these the strange things that the Oath of Dagon talk about, this other race? Either way, after sneaking through the large warehouses, Jack finds Ruth Billingham, and the two make it to the truck and to Brian. Ruth Billingham will eventually become a deep one, which is why she cannot leave. She has the Innsmouth look. It turns out that Ramona Waite was a hybrid and would eventually turn into a deep one herself. And this is learned through Thomas Waite's diary in which she considers Mercy killing her because he knows she will eventually turn. Same as her mother. As they are driving away though, Brian is shot and killed and the truck crashes and explodes, killing Ruth. Jack is saved by two FBI agents, one being a man named J. Edgar Hoover. With Jack in hospital in Arkham again, recovering, Hoover asks what Jack's business was. A cocky response earns Jack a slap in the face along with some shock therapy. Hoover says that Innsmouth is rife with criminal activity, but the government won't sanction a full-scale operation without more evidence. Hoover says that thanks to Jack's meddling, Mackie has gone missing, and that Mackie was actually close to finding the evidence that they needed. Hoover essentially forces Jack to go with the FBI back to Innsmouth on a small-scale raid on the Marsh Refinery. The refinery itself is the main source of wealth for the Marsh family and has been cut off from the outside world for the past 50 years. Hoover simply believes that this is the work of a criminal gang and has no idea of the things that await them inside. Arriving there at the refinery, Hoover tells Jack that Sebastian Marsh, the great grandson of Captain Obed Marsh and the manager of the refinery, is away on business and that he's left his son Jacob in charge. The FBI agents and Jack are met with a constant stream of gunfire. Jack sneaks round and takes the guy out, allowing the agents entry into the refinery. Hoover says that he wants Marsh alive. Not long after this, one of the agents comes out of nowhere and his skin has been melted off, similar to the man Jack saw in the sewers underneath Innsmouth. Jack needs to restore power to the elevator. Going down a level, Jack finds it crawling with members of the order. He gets the generator back up and running and jumps onto a conveyor belt and he sees a man get turned to mulch. And then a short while later, he comes face to face with Jacob Marsh. Marsh tries to kill Jack, but he narrowly escapes. Running after Marsh, Jack is ambushed by more of the order. Later, Jack finds a letter from Sebastian Marsh. His business trip seems to be going well, but in his letter, he speaks of a beast in the refinery. Jack then comes across Hoover, but he's been captured by Jacob Marsh, who tries to kill him by lowering him into red hot ore. But Jack saves the day. Good news is that Marsh left his briefcase behind, containing enough evidence for the full-scale raid that Hoover was hoping for. Further into the refinery, Jack is clocked over the head by Marsh. Remember the Shoggoth? Well, it's here, in the refinery. And Marsh releases it to kill Jack, and then runs off. Jack evades the violent tendrils of the beast, and manages to activate the vat pump, getting rid of the beast. For now. Jack then meets up with Hoover, who has managed to capture Jacob Marsh alive. Marsh says the Order will make them all pay, and praises Cthulhu and Dagon before being taken away. Hoover says that they found a key on Marsh, a key for the bottom floor of the refinery. Naturally, all of Hoover's agents are busy planting explosives in order to blow the place up, so he wants Jack to go down and check out the bottom floor. 
Classic. Jack has 30 minutes before the refinery is blown to pieces. Down on the bottom floor is a secret gold vault where the marshes have been hoarding all of their wealth. The Shoggoth is down there, but after some creativity involving gas valves, Jack manages to fill a room with gas, opens a large broken door making sparks fly, igniting the gas and getting rid of the Shoggoth in the process. But the Shoggoth seems to have been guarding something, a door. A door to a private worship room featuring a statue of the Great One himself. Cthulhu. Jack is locked in but uses a plinth to retrieve a clear red stone. Hoover enters and tells Jack that they need to leave as the place is about to blow. They make it out of the refinery and watch the place blow up. The briefcase recovered from Jacob Marsh revealed a lot more. The Marshes have been offering a contagion to the highest bidder, but Jack recalls the carvings and statues that he saw in the refinery and thinks that they seem fairly similar. But due to that evidence, Innsmouth has been placed under martial law and the US Marines have been called in as well as the Coast Guard. Robert Marsh and the Order have shut themselves inside the Masonic Hall of the Esoteric Order of Dagon. Hoover wants Robert Marsh alive, so naturally, Jack is needed again. It seems that the Order have placed some sort of seal on the doors of the hall though, as some Marines got too close to the doors and had suffered a psychotic seizure. Hoover then recalled an old smuggling tunnel close to the river. Meeting up with some marines and crossing a frozen lake, Jack meets up with a soldier, but after thawing a frozen door, the soldier gets too curious and is killed by something. This something is called the Star Spawn of Cthulhu. These creatures descended directly from the great Cthulhu himself, and even so much as looking at one can greatly damage someone's sanity. Jack destroys the creature with a flamethrower and finds the dynamite the now deceased soldier was carrying. Further into the tunnel, Jack finds Mackie in a cell, who confirms that the seal on the doors to the hall was implemented through a sacred ceremony. Trying his best to avoid members of the order, Jack finds the seal on the door, which seems to give him a very bad headache. He also finds another door with a strange seal, along with a portal. A diary belonging to Robert Marsh reveals that his main goal is to translate some stone tablets, which explains why the Marshes and the Order of Dagon needed the Book of Dagon off of Thomas Waite. The Order robbed the store and tried to get into the safe, obviously failing in their goal. Marsh then speaks of a place beneath the waves where they will take the word of Father Dagon and set in motion their plan of grand design. They will then, according to Marsh, ascend to a true knowledge in the love and service of Father Dagon and Mother Hydra. Marsh then talks of a sacrifice. Robert plans to succeed where Obed failed. Jack sees yet another creepy hallucination involving Ramona Waite. Inside the safe, Jack also finds a scripture, noting that another ship captain, an Abner Ezekiel Hoag, discovered the tribe in Polynesia way before Obed Marsh did, and notes that the tribe even interbred with strange beings from the sea, leading to the humans transforming into sea creatures as they grew older. Using the Book of Dagon, Jack breaks the seal on one of the doors by uttering a prayer. Eventually, Jack finds a key and is able to get Mackie out of his cell. Fighting his way through the Order's building alongside Mackie, who opens a secret area for Jack, Jack enters into a prayer room. In there, he finds a fully transformed Robert Marsh conducting a ceremony and praying to a statue of Cthulhu, flanked by what appear to be mages. Jack deals with the two mages and reveals a secret door leading to a smuggling tunnel. He finds a table containing two slots for stone tablets. Marsh must have grabbed them when running away. Jack gives chase to Robert Marsh through the tunnel, but he falls through the ground and into the sea. Luckily, Jack is pulled out of the sea by the Coast Guard's ship, the Cutter Urania. The crew of the Urania have heard chatter regarding an underwater stronghold, accessible via Devil's Reef and more smuggling tunnels. While speaking to a sailor, Jack sees another man get pulled overboard. Creatures from the sea, Deep Ones, are attacking the ship. The crew, along with Jack, manage to fight the Deep Ones off. Their struggles aren't over yet though. Huge waves smash the ship. The source of the waves are more mages on Devil's Reef, and using the cannon, Jack manages to get rid of them all. Another problem has arisen though, in that Deep Ones have made it below deck. The captain has gone insane and locked himself in his quarters. The remaining crew need to head for the armory below deck. The captain has offed himself, but Jack grabbed the armory key. He is now sufficiently armed in order to deal with any Deep Ones he may encounter. Whilst all this was happening, Robert Marsh had made it to Devil's Reef and had used the stone discs given to Obed Marsh along with a human sacrifice to summon Father Dagon. And Father Dagon, like clockwork, decides to attack the ship. Jack defeats the sea-dwelling monstrosity, but Father Dagon drags the ship down into the depths. Jack has another vision of an otherworldly place, but comes to having been washed up on the shores of Devil's Reef. 
Jack is not alone on Devil's Reef, as he sees a sailor being killed by a creature. Jack comes across the location from which Robert Marsh summoned Father Dagon, and finds one of the metal discs. Further into the island, Jack sees wall murals depicting fish men and women interbreeding. Is this what afflicted the town of Innsmouth? Jack makes his way through, avoiding traps and precarious situations, until he comes across a large deep hole. He jumps in, and falls deeper, and deeper, and deeper. Jack is now in the City of the Deep Ones. Not long after his arrival, he hears Sebastian Marsh having a conversation with some fishmen. He's talking about the streets of Innsmouth being filled with soldiers, and that the order is completely overrun. He says it's not going to be too long until the Navy find their underwater city, and that whatever Robert plans to do, he needs to do it very soon. Further into the city, Jack is trapped and captured by Sebastian Marsh and is imprisoned. It gets worse, they've confiscated the Book of Dagon. It doesn't take long for Jack to escape his confinement though. After a long journey through the caves and tunnels of the city, Jack overhears Robert and Sebastian Marsh talking. Well, arguing. Sebastian has taken exception to Robert having religious ceremonies while they are being attacked. Sebastian talks of a lab and their research, and Robert tells him that he shut the lab down, much to Sebastian's dismay. Robert is still trying to translate the two stone tablets, so all the Order's efforts need to go towards that instead. He says that the work of his great-grandfather, Obed, must be finished. Sebastian foolishly attempts to shoot Robert, leading to Sebastian going all Darth Vader on him. Then you can guess what happens next. Jack falls through the grate and into Robert's office. Robert tries his best to kill Jack, but Jack beats him. On his desk is the Book of Dagon. Jack can now hear the rumble and tremble of the US Navy submarine torpedoes hitting the city. Jack discovers the lab that Sebastian was talking about earlier on. All manner of creepy experiments exist carried out by another of the Marsh family, Esther. She's been carrying out tests on a plant which seems to be able to harm the Great Cthulhu, but that result in disfigurement in humans. An example of this is a test subject in the lab talking of being cursed with a vile plague. As you recall, Jacob Marsh was away on business aiming to sell a bioweapon, which was likely developed in that lab. After being chased by more deep ones, Jack makes it to a very similar room to the one he saw in the harmonic house back in 1915. Jack uses a green stone obtained on his journey throughout the city in order to power up the portal, and the bright white light takes him to another part of the city. He picks up an otherworldly weapon called a Yithian power weapon, capable of shooting powerful energy. He enters into some air-filled tunnels and has to fight two flying polyps. These polyps were actually themselves one of the first races on Earth. They wanted to colonise, but when it came to the seas, the polyps were driven back by the Elder Things. Cthulhu is an Elder Thing, by the way. Not long afterwards, about 50 million years ago, the great race of Yith arrived, leading to war. The great race of Yith were getting their asses handed to them, that was until the great race created the very weapon that Jack just found. So, Jack charges it up, and defeats the flying polyps. He enters into an area which houses the Temple of Dagon. Inside, the gargantuan Mother Hydra. She's having a good old sing-song, and her song is generating a protective barrier, stopping the navy torpedoes from hitting the city. Jack rather creatively uses a large gong to stop Mother Hydra's singing, and since she isn't deafening him anymore, he manages to take control of Deep Ones, fills her pool with water, and shoots the pool with a Yithian weapon, frying her. Mother Hydra is dead, leaving the city open to attack. Jack now needs to escape. The entire city is crumbling, but Jack just about makes it to a tablet, and he recites a prayer from the Order of Dagon, which powers up a portal which, itself, takes Jack back into the esoteric Order of Dagon's Hall, and into the presence of J. Edgar Hoover and Lucas Mackey. Jack is in shock and passes out, and Jack is then committed to Arkham Asylum once again. He'd gone completely mad, and he retires himself. The extended ending of the game is actually locked behind obtaining a top ranking, which is ridiculous, but mods help me out here. Therefore, let's explain what the ending means. Warning, it gets pretty wacky. So after Jack passed out when in the Order's headquarters, Jack regains some of his lost memories from the six years that were lost due to the amnesia. He has a vision of speaking to a member of the great race of Yith. You'll recognise this creature as one of the same creatures that came out of the portal in the harmonic house at the start of the game. When Jack was in the harmonic house and collapsed, a mind swap took place. Jack swapped minds with one of the Yithian creatures, meaning that for the six years that Jack was incarcerated in the Arkham Asylum, his body was actually being controlled by a Yithian, and Jack was somewhere else completely, the Yithian world. This is why the police who found Jack in the harmonic house described him as insane, 
and almost like a completely different person. I know, madness, but bear with me, it gets even more crazy. Jack recalls the conversation he had with the Yithian. The Yithian states that a war is coming, with the flying polyps, and that very soon the entire Yithian race will be wiped out, and that Jack needs to go back to his real body, hence why Jack snapped back to reality, so to speak. It turns out that the reason Jack remembered absolutely nothing was due to the Yithians, because this is something they do a lot apparently, having a custom of wiping people's memories after the mad old mind swap. This is why at the start of the game after leaving the asylum, Jack comments on the incident at the harmonic house feeling like it only happened yesterday. But here's the mental part. Jack is half Yithian. Jack had been chosen by the Yithians as the host for one of their race. The Yithian Jack was speaking to said that the moment Jack was conceived, he, this exact Yithian, swapped minds with Jack's father, meaning that Jack technically has two dads. His earthly dad, who later retired himself, I guess due to going insane, and also his Yithian father. And this is why Yith cultists saw Jack as special. Anyway, before they sent Jack's mind back to his body, they told him, when the time comes, you will remember, and that they will be waiting in the shadows of his dreams. And then, as we all know, Jack ended himself. Now a lot of people think that this asylum scene happened before the events of the main game and that Jack survived his attempt, but at the end we can see that Jack is being tormented by hallucinations of Ramona Waite, thus pretty much confirming that this scene took place after Jack's experience in Innsmouth. And that concludes this story for this game. There were actually two or three additional games planned, including a sequel to this game, but Headfirst Studios unfortunately went bankrupt and were liquidised in 2006. If you enjoyed this video then please leave a like and subscribe to the channel to support and so you don't miss out on future videos hit the bell icon too. Leave a comment below with your thoughts on this game and if you really want you can support me on Patreon for the small amount of £1 a month. But anyway for now take care and I'll see you in the next video.